Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome po to our uh, psychogeriatric didactics today. Before we begin, let's um, start with a prayer. So let us put ourselves in the presence of the Lord, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Dear Lord, we come to you in the spirit of learning, humility, and love. We are grateful for this opportunity to learn from each other and grow closer in our faith. We ask that you bless our time together as we listen to the first psychogeriatric lecture today. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So thank you for that opening prayer. And good afternoon, everyone. I am Bong Bonaventura, current president of the Philippine Psychiatric Association. As has been mentioned, this is the first uh, psychogeriatric session for the year. This is a new project that we have initiated on behalf of the Philippine Psychiatric Association in collaboration with the Department of Psychiatry of the University of the East Ramon Magsaysay Memorial Medical Center. Uh, for Particularly for the residents and the early career psychiatrists who are with us today, you may be familiar with some of uh, similar didactic sessions that you may have had with the Consortium on Child Psychiatry and also the Consortium on addiction psychiatry. So this is the first time we are going to have a similar program, but this time focused on uh, psychogeriatrics. Okay. Recording in progress. Okay. So a while back, um, I was asked by one of our, uh, shall we say, a more senior psychiatrist, as, because they were confused as to whether this was a didactic training program. I said, no, these are just special sessions in which we will tackle topics that are not usually included in the didactic sessions in the psychogeriatrics. Because usually for, for the past, since I, since I did my training in Sydney, Australia on psychiatry of old age and came back to the Philippines in 1991, over the years I've been doing uh, short courses or seminar workshops for various training institutions and usually we cover various topics that are very specific to uh, psychogeriatrics. But in all those, all those cases, we usually do not talk about comprehensive geriatric assessment because that is something that is done by our colleagues in geriatric medicine. We do psychogeriatric assessment, but it's not as comprehensive as what a geriatrician would do. And that's why we are very fortunate today that we have the opportunity to listen and hear from an expert about this particular topic. I know some institutions, for example, at the National Center for Mental Health, they do have uh, sessions on uh, comprehensive geriatric assessment simply because they have uh, on staff uh, geriatricians. So the senior residents at NCMH are able to undergo uh, training or lectures on CGA, which would be complemented by uh, the seminar workshops with me on psychogeriatrics. Okay. And I'm also very pleased to have the UERM Department of Psychiatry collaborate with us on this project because I personally feel that it is much better to have it um, clinically based in a hospital or institution setting so that we could encourage the we encourage the younger um, members in our profession to to join. So the target of these uh, sessions are primarily the senior residents and early career psychiatrists, as defined by the American Psychiatric Association. Early career psychiatrists are individuals who have who are within seven years of completion of their basic training in psychiatry. Okay, So these are young individuals who are starting out in their practice. In the Philippines, unfortunately, when we talk about, uh, when we talk about psychogeriatrics, not all institutions are able to provide, um, shall we say, expert training in, on, on this topic. Okay, uh, that's, that's why in my case, I, I do, I, let's say I, I go around different training institutions so that I may be able to share my expertise. And that's the reason we for, for these sessions that we want to include early career psychiatrists because not all of them have been able or were, were able to go through such a seminar or workshop with me previously. So hopefully the topics that we will be able to tackle in these sessions would add to their set of skills as uh, clinical practitioners in the field of psychiatry. 
But more importantly, for the younger members of the audience, particularly for the senior psychiatry, senior uh, psychiatry residents, the sessions are designed primarily to complement what uh, what's being discussed as far as the, the didactics or seminars that they have in during their training program. So the topics uh, we will discuss here in uh, uh, in the secondary attic sessions would be, um, shall we say, a little bit more specialized. Okay. In fact, for our subsequent topics, we will, of course, uh, try to invite local geriatric psychiatrists in the country. But I have also in, already initiated uh, discussions and invitations with psychogeriatricians who are based in the U.S., okay, so that they can uh, share with us their uh, 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 state-of-the-art uh, expertise as well. Unfortunately, the challenge with inviting uh, psychogeriatricians in the U.S. would be that the time difference. So one, one expert that I've already talked to said that she's willing to record her lecture and that uh, and, th and then we can play this during the sessions and then any discussions or questions that um, may come out of that we can collate and then email to her that she will respond to them okay um, but I can also provide some degree of uh, feedback or response uh, and so that's what we're also trying to work out okay so both local and international uh, experts are are will be invited to participate in the psychogeriatric session. So that's something that we will uh, look forward to. So you may notice that we have set the initial meeting today uh, on March 6th. So this is the first Monday of the month. So we are striving to continue the schedule every first Monday of the month from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Initially, we thought to do it at 6 p.m., but, um, but uh, upon advice, and based on the experience with the child psychiatry and addiction psychiatry consortium, that it's better to do it during the day so that more residents will be able to participate. So although we have target audience for this, but this is again open to everyone. Everyone who has an interest in psychogeriatrics are welcome to join the sessions. And we hope to be able to do it every first Monday of the month subsequently. Of course, there will be months that we will not be able to do it, uh, for example, uh, like if it's going to coincide, let's say, with the major annual conventions and things like that. Okay, okay. So, uh, so that's that's it as far as the introduction is concerned. Again, uh, thank you very much for all of you who are here uh, this afternoon joining us online, and then also very appreciative of the support being provided to me by the UER and Department of Psychiatry, particularly its uh, resident staff. Okay, and now I have the pleasure to introduce to you our speaker, the very first speaker for the psychogeriatric sessions of the Philippine Psychiatric Association and the UERM Department of Psychiatry. So when I was trying to envision this project, um, this topic uh, actually came to mind right away. And I was very fortunate that during our last uh, annual convention that I, was, had, I had the opportunity to be able to talk to our speaker right away because uh, she was there attending the convention as well. Uh, she's, a, she's a very humble person. So when I asked her for her CV so that I could uh, give her an, a proper introduction, she just gave me four short lines. So, um, so I'd like to share with you uh, this uh, very, very brief introduction for our very, very expert speaker. Okay. She had her residency training in internal medicine at the Las Piñas Doctors Hospital, and she subsequently had her fellowship in geriatric medicine at the St. Luke's Medical Center in Quezon City. For those of you who are not aware, the St. Luke's uh, Medical Center, uh, Quezon City Geriatric Center, was the very first institution to provide training in geriatric medicine, even ahead of the UPPGH. Okay? And after my training, in psychogeriatrics in Sydney, Australia, when I came back to the Philippines, I actually joined the geriatric center until I guess 1990. So, so that was 1991. And I, I, I guess for about a decade, um, uh, I, I think 2005, so a little more than that, because that was the time when I went to Australia for further work in clinical research. So for a long time, I had the opportunity 
to provide training as well to the fellows in geriatric medicine at SLMCQC. Our speaker is a diplomat and fellow of the Philippine College of Physicians and also therefore a diplomat and fellow of the Philippine College of Geriatric Medicine. So it is with great pleasure and appreciation, so many, many thanks, uh, that I present to you our speaker, Dr. Sharon Antonio Bonaceda. Good afternoon, Dr. Sharon. Good afternoon, Dr. Bong, and thank you po for uh, inviting me and giving me this opportunity. Po. Thank you. Okay. Shall I start, Dr. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So, hi, good afternoon. I am Sharon Buenaceda, and I'm happy and honored to be one of your speakers. Or, I didn't know the first speaker pala for your uh, psychogeriatric sessions. So, these are my, um, sorry. Yes. So uh, these are my objectives, and I hope I will be able to enlighten you about CGA and its role in elderly care. So comprehensive geriatric assessment, or CGA, is a multidimensional process designed to assess the functional ability, physical, cognitive, mental health, and socio-environmental situation of older people. So the results are coupled with sustained individually tailored interventions like rehabilitation, education, counseling, and supportive services. So the core tool of us geriatricians is the CGA. So it is essential to maximizing the well-being and independence of older adults in that it identifies areas of vulnerability and estimates physiologic reserve. So we place high value on functional status. So it is the functional status that we evaluate more, considering this as possible cause of decline and also as an outcome to be improved or at least maintained. So uh, CGA may uh, uncover treatable health problems and lead to better health outcomes. And that is one of the benefits of doing a CGA. So other benefits are as follows. We have improved functional and mental status. Uh, it uh, provides reduced mortality, decreased use of nursing homes and acute care hospitals, greater satisfaction with care because you develop individualized care, and you develop support plans. Uh, CGA provides framework for the delivery of interventions and evaluation of long-term care needs and optimal placement if the patient needs to be uh, placed in a nursing home or a home care setup. So again, CGA is a broad term for health evaluation of older patients with emphasis on components and outcomes different from that of the standard medical evaluation. So it recognizes that the health status of older persons is dependent on influences beyond the manifestations of their medical conditions. Now, these components and influences we pertain to as the geriatric syndromes. So uh, we know the term syndrome has been defined as a group of signs and symptoms that occur together and characterize a particular abnormality. Uh, but geriatric syndrome represents the result of a series of processes or changes suggesting multifactorial pathophysiology, so multiple disorders interact to cause it and are strongly associated with poor outcomes. So the impact of this can be profound on the quality of life of both older people and caregivers. So with that said, effective treatment for every single geriatric syndrome identified requires addressing more than one factor. <clears throat> Excuse me. So for example, a patient presenting with hip fracture. Now this hip fracture will give us a list of geriatric syndromes as possible causes, as well as a list of geriatric syndromes as outcomes of the fracture. Okay, so with the example of a hip fracture as the presentation of the patient, the immediate cause, let's say, is a fall. And the fall as a geriatric syndrome could be due to a medical condition and or other geriatric syndromes like incontinence, dementia, previous falls, gait and balance problems, nutrition, etc. So on the other hand, the fall that resulted to a hip fracture can also lead to another list of geriatric syndromes like further falls due to fear of falling, depression, dementia, etc. So CGA is a three-step process. So we target appropriate patients, 
we do the assessment and development of recommendations and most importantly, implementation of the recommendations. So in St. Luke's Medical Center, they use the screening tool called St. Luke's uh, Short Geriatric Screening or SLSGS. This is being conducted by the CGA nurse or the geriatric center nurse to all patients who are senior citizens admitted. So each criterion has a designated weighted score. The total score is seven, but CGA will still be recommended even for a single yes answer. So the CGA is mostly done in an outpatient setting, but may also be done as inpatient with a follow-up CGA upon discharge. But apart from the SLSGS, those who have one or a few medical conditions or those needing preventive measures only are too well to benefit from a CGA. So we may not do CGA to these patients. So we address medical issues or concerns, and then we may do the screening again depending on the need during clinic visits. So those who are critically terminally ill or medically unstable are too ill to benefit from a CGA. So even if a patient scores seven in the SLSGS, but the patient has significant electrolyte imbalance like hyponatremia, we don't proceed with CGA until such a time that the patient becomes stable. So those with multiple interacting bios, psychological problems that are amenable to treatment or disorders that require rehabilita rehabilitation therapy definitely will benefit from a CGA. So step two, assessment and development of recommendations is highly variable. So it relies on a multidisciplinary team, which includes the following. Uh, the composition of the team is determined by the patient's needs based on history and physical exam, local expertise, and availability of resources. And moving toward a virtual team concept, wherein members are included as needed and assessments are conducted at different locations and different days. Data or plans from each member may be collected electronically through phone calls or through referral letter response. <clears throat> so I'd like to show uh, lang my personal CGA for. So this is my um, CGA forms. No? So as you can see, no, I included in the demographics the primary decision maker because it's important no, to know to whom are we talking to and to whom should we discuss our plans later on. Uh, we should know that all the primary, the primary caregiver and other caregivers involved, no, uh, they will help us with uh, history uh, taking. Uh, chief complaints, the same as the usual uh, medical history, review of systems. Um, we give um, importance to false history. Uh, there's the past medical history and they also have a list of the doctors uh, currently involved in the patient care. This is uh, to coordinate care later on if there's a need and for me uh, not to step too much on their uh, management. So list of medication, all medications, including supplements, herbal medicines, uh, these, um, all of uh, these medications are important um, as we go through the lecture later on. Um, we uh, also give emphasis on the personal and social history just to give a uh, uh, bird's eye view on how the patient is at home during uh, his or her day-to-day -day activities. Diet and exercise, important. And for the physical examination, we include the devices or contraptions, devices used. Maybe patient now is not using a cane, and then on the next visit, the patient, uh, if the patient suddenly used a cane, a cane, then it might signal us uh, something uh, about his uh, functional abilities. Uh, vision, hearing, we'll talk about that later, and also presence of dentures. Okay. So I have a blank page here just to list all the problems, concerns, and their um, and their uh, the plans for each. And then to complete my CGA, I have this table. No, so um, I get the weight, height, BMI for nutrition, the hand grip for frailty. Uh, these are functional ability assessment. Uh, the DSRS and the FAST for dementia patients. Uh, this is for nutrition uh, assessment. These are for cognitive assessment. So we will all talk about that later. Uh, this is the depression scale, Tinetti and SPPB, SPPB for uh, fall risk assessment. Yeah. 
So let us now go with overview of the different tools for assessment. The geriatric assessment begins with a review of the two key divisions of functional ability. So activities of daily living or LDL and instrumental activities of daily living or IADL. So deficits can signal the need for more in-depth evaluation of the patient's social environmental circumstances and the need for additional assistance with the caregiver at home or the need for nursing home placement. So it is a summary measure of the overall impact of health conditions in the context of his or her environment and social support system. It is an important consideration in all care planning. It aids on what additional diagnostic inter, uh, evaluations and interventions will be needed. It can be used to monitor response to treatment, and it may provide prognostic information that will help plan for long-term care. So for the benefit of the trainees, no, ADL are self-care activities that a person performs daily to live independently. So that includes eating, dressing, bathing, transferring between the bed and the chair, using the toilet, controlling bladder, and bowel functions. Your ADL are activities or skills necessary to live without assistance in the community. That is doing housework, preparing meals, taking medications properly, managing finances, using a telephone and means of transport. So physicians can acquire useful uh, functional information by simply observing older patients as they complete simple tasks such as unbuttoning and buttoning a shirt, uh, picking up a pen and writing a sentence, taking off and putting on shoes and climbing up and down from an examination table. So assessing the IADLs provides uh, necessary information for safety related to independent living. So this is why it is uh, ideal for community dwelling older adults and not ideal for use with older adults who reside in long-term care facilities. So it provides an early warning of functional decline or signal the need for further assessment. So instruments for assessing ADL and IADL include the CATS ADL scale, Barthel index, and the Lawton IADL scale. So in a study done at Mount Sinai, a three years IADL impairment is a predictor of incident dementia. So for nutrition, we use the mini nutritional assessment. So it is a validated nutritional screening and assessment tool that can identify geriatric patients who are malnourished or at risk of malnutrition. So this is the MA form. It includes uh, assessment of these parameters. <clears throat> uh, it has a total score of 30, scores above 24, uh, indicates patients who are well-nourished, those who scores... Uh, fall below 17 points indicates malnutrition, and scores in between will place patients at risk of malnutrition. <clears throat> so there is no uniformly accepted definition of undernutrition in older adults. So the American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition in 2012 defined malnutrition as presence of at least two of the following criteria. So another definition for GLIM in 2018 requires at least one of the following etiologic criteria and at least one of the following phenotypic criteria. So in American Geriatric Society, they grade severity of malnutrition as follows. So reduced uh, muscle mass at the far end volume uh, is identified by dual uh, energy absorptiometry, bioelectrical impedance, ultrasound, CT, or MRI. So alternatives in the clinic are measurements of your calf or arm muscle circumferences. So the screening methods for assessing nutrition in older adults that you can use in your clinics are presence of weight loss and calculation of the BMI. Okay, so overweight naman is defined as BMI of 23 to 24.9 kilograms per meter square while obesity is more than 24.9. So this is the Asia-Pacific classification. Uh, but uh, from a meta-analysis done in 2014 regarding BMI for the elderly, looking at BMI and all-cause mortality, though they used the WHO classification, they found that the sweetest spot with the lowest rates of mortality was when an older adult had a BMI of 27 to 27.9, so meaning the lowest risk of death, and also found that older adults were still good up to a BMI of 30.9. Interestingly, even at a BMI of 33, they did not see a significant, significant increase in mortality. 
So let's now go to falls. So a fall is an event which results in a person coming to rest inadvertently on the ground or floor or other lower level. So falls are the second leading cause of unintentional injury deaths worldwide. So each year, an estimated 684,000 individuals die from falls globally, of which over 80% are in low and middle income countries. So that includes us. So 37.3 million falls that are severe enough to require medical attention occur each year. So fall risk screening is an important first step in fall prevention, but must be followed by a thorough assessment and the development of a plan that tailors uh, person-centered interventions to address identified risk factors. So all elderly should be screened at least once a year to establish their fall risk profile. So older people tend to fall more frequently and are more likely to experience injury from a fall, such as hip fractures and colles fractures. Okay, so a fall from standing height hitting the greater uh, trochanter directly onto the floor has a 21-fold higher risk for hip fracture compared with landing on another body part. So for the colles fracture, there is almost always time for older women or men to deploy their upper extremities in the event of a fall. And a fall by an older woman from 25 centimeters or more onto a stiff surface when landing with a straight arm will almost certainly break the wrist. Okay. So these are the risk factors uh, for falls. Stroke leads to impaired balance and cognitive impairments. Uh, cognitive impairment, no, we know the executive functioning gives you the ability to plan, think flexibly, respond to feedback, and inhibit impulsive responses. So incontinence uh, symptoms that will give patient the tendency to get to the comfort room faster Nocturia, which interrupts sleep, can also lead to falls. So frequency and polyuria can lead to metabolic changes that can lead to falls. So for the medications for the psychoactives, the benzodiazepines, antidepressants, and antipsychotics, you have two to three-fold increased risk of falling and a two-fold increased risk of experiencing a hip fracture. And taking four or more medications significantly increases the risk for falling because there are a greater number of side effects associated with multiple medication use, and the side effects are often more intense. So interactions between medications can um, also cause side effects. Medications react differently in the body as a person ages, which can increase the risk for falling. So for the history of falls, lead, uh, that leads to fear of falling, which can cause lack of confidence in maintaining balance during normal activities and may result in restrictions of physical activity. So both depression and fear of falling are associated with impairment of gait and balance and uh, an association that is uh, mediated through cognitive, sensory, and motor pathways. So female gender is attributed to reduced muscle strength and more frequent use of psychotropic medications. Older women has higher prevalence of osteoporosis. Uh, for inactivity, we know that physical activity can improve strength, balance, and functional abilities in older people and can prevent falls. For muscle weakness, if you have poor knee extension and ankle dorsiflexor, they are found to be major risk for falling as well. So presence of visual conditions such as cataracts and glaucoma or impaired contrast sensitivity and depth perception is a risk factor for falls and fractures as it increases the likelihood of misjudging obstacles in the environment. For reduced uh, peripheral sensation, sensory systems provide information about the nature of a balance perturbation under challenging conditions. For poor reaction time, adequate central processing and reaction time are necessary for voluntarily correcting a balance perturbation. So impaired balance can result from impairments in sensory, motor, and central processing systems. So if you have a if you have geriatric patients, screen for fall risk at least annually or more frequently as the number of risk factors increase. So ask three questions to determine risk. Uh, you feel unsteady when standing or walking. Are there worries about falling? And if the patient has fallen in the past year? So if yes, ask how many times at the end if the patient was injured. 
So there are a lot of available false assessment tools, but this is what we use during my training and what I still use now. So this is the Tineti Gate and Balance Test. It is an easily administered task-oriented test that measures an adult's gait and balance abilities. So it rates the ability of an individual to maintain balance while performing activities of daily living related tasks. So components include uh, balance and lower and upper extremity strength. So it requires 10 to 15 minutes to administer. So maximum score for the gate is 12. Maximum score for the balance is 16. So you have a total maximum maximum total score of uh, 28 points. So if it's less than 24, you are at, at risk for falls, while less than 19 is high risk for falls. So going to cognition, dementia is defined as a chronic acquired decline in one or more cognitive domains. So you have your learning and memory, complex attention, language, visual, spatial, and executive, uh, sufficient to affect daily life. So dementia is largely unrecognized and underdiagnosed. So clinicians should have a low threshold for triggering an investigation for possible cognitive impairment. So suitable screening tests in review uh, the MMSE Filipino and Montreal Cognitive Assessment Filipino version to name a few. So MINICOG is a fast and simple screening test to help detect dementia in its early stages. So in just three minutes, it can help identify possible cognitive impairment in older patients. So this gives uh, people who are starting to show signs of cognitive impairment a better chance for early diagnosis and care and improved quality of life now and later on. So it is simple to use and can help determine if we need more detailed assessment. So you can easily include this in regular clinic visit or during uh, routine annual exams since it takes less than 10 minutes and no special medical knowledge needed. So this involves three word registration and recall and clock drawing. So the total score is five, zero to three points for word recall and zero or two points for the clock drawing. So scores less than three indicate higher likelihood of clinically imp uh, important cognitive impairment when greater sensitivity is desired, a cut point of less than four is recommended as it may indicate a need for further evaluation of cognitive status. So this is the AD8 dementia screening interview lifted from the Dementia Society of the Philippines. So a spontaneous self-correction is allowed for all responses without counting as an error. So the questions are given to the respondent self-administration or can be read aloud to the respondent. So it is preferable to administer the AD8 to an informant if available. If read aloud, it is important for the clinician to carefully read the phrase as worded and give emphasis to no changes due to cognitive problems and not due to physical problems. So interpretation adapted from Galvin et al., the AD8 is quite sensitive to detecting early cognitive changes associated uh, with many common dementing illness, including Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, uh, Lewy body dementia and frontotemporal dementia. So scores in the impaired range, that is uh, two or greater, indicate a need for further assessment. And scores in the normal range, that is less than two, suggest that a dementing disorder is unlikely, but a very early disease process cannot be ruled out. So the mini uh, mental state exam is a tool that can be used to systematically assess mental status. So it is an 11 question measure that tests five uh, areas of cognitive function, uh, the orientation, registration, attention and calculation, recall, and language. So the maximum score is 30. A score of 23 or lower is indicative of cognitive impairment. Uh, the MMSE is effective as a screening instrument to separate patients with cognitive impairment from those without it. So in addition, when used repeatedly, the instrument is able to measure changes in cognitive status that may benefit from intervention. However, the tool is not able to diagnose the case for changes in cognitive function and should not replace a complete clinical assessment of mental status. So in addition, the instrument relies heavily on verbal response and reading and writing. Therefore, patients that are uh, hearing and visually impaired, intubated, have low English literacy, or those with other communication disorders may perform poor, uh, poorly even when cognitively intact. 
So brief cognitive tests accurately distinguish AD from a uh, normal condition, but are less accurate in distinguishing a mild cognitive impairment or MCI from AD. So uh, MOCA P, uh, the Filipino version, is a good screening tool in the Philippines to help clinicians detect dementia early and accurately. So it has been shown to be sensitive to mild cognitive impairment. And uh, MOCA is acceptable worldwide as a screening instrument, not only for AD, but also for other types of dementia, such as vascular cognitive impairment. So depression, going to depression, depression uh, frequently coexists with mild cognitive impairment. It remains underdiagnosed and undertreated and may contribute to dementia progression. So major depression occurs approximately 2% of people aged more than 55 and increases with age. So 15% may have clinically significant depressive symptoms without major depression. So recognizing and diagnosing uh, late-life depression can be difficult. So older adults may complain of lack of energy or other somatic symptoms, uh, attribute symptoms to older age, to old age or other physical conditions, or neglect to mention them to the healthcare professional. Okay, so uh, consider screening with patient health questionnaire too. So over the past two weeks, have you often had little interest or pleasure in doing things? Uh, and over the past week, have you often been, been bothered by feeling down, depressed, or hopeless? So you score each item as uh, follows. And the score of uh, at least three indicates high probability of depressive disorder, in which case uh, you need to do a follow-up and assess uh, the patient further. So the first created geriatric depression scale has been tested and used extensively with the older population. So this is the GDS long form. It is a brief 30-item questionnaire in which participants are asked to respond by answering yes or no in reference to how they felt over the past week. So it is a self-rating scale intended primarily for use in clinical settings. But the GDS was also translated to Filipino. So this was copied from its validation study in 2019 using the RASH analysis. So from the 30-item GDS long form, they were able to include uh, 15 items among the 30 items translated in Filipino. So making the final list of questions for the Filipino GDS short form. So scoring is still the same. Scores between 0 and 4 are considered normal, whereas scores ranging from 10 to 15 indicate moderate to severe depression. So the authors, however, emphasize that this is not a drop-in replacement for the English uh, GDS-15, and the two forms have only five items in common. So for visual impairment, it is defined as visual acuity, uh, 20 over 40 or worse. Uh, severe visual impairment or legal blindness is 20 over 200. So uh, this table uh, just shows uh, examples of problems with daily tasks for older people and um, more or less the estimate of their uh, possible visual acuity. So if they have uh, problems reading uh, newspaper print, probably their visual acuity is at least 20 over 50. If they have problems reading large prints, probably it's at least 20 uh, over 70. If they have uh, problems writing checks, probably it's uh, 20 over 100 at least, and reading paper uh, currency, uh, at least 20 over 400. So uh, uh, you do acuity testing for near vision using the handheld Rosenbaum card at 14 inches. Uh, 14 inches. So visual fields by confrontation techniques can still be used. Um, you can assess for visual impairment uh, with also with the aid of your ophthalmoscopy to look for other possible causes of visual problems. Uh, you need emergent referral if there are acute change in the vision. And... Um, most importantly for geriatrics, always medication review for drugs associated with ocular adverse effects. So prevention, uh, the American Geriatric Society advised biennial full eye exams for people aged more than 65 at diagnosis and the full eye exam every one to two years for people with diabetes.
So for hearing impairment, this is the most common sensory impairment in old age. So presbycusis affects 30 to 47% of the population older than 65. Uh, it is strongly correlated with depression, decreased quality of life, poorer memory and executive function, and incident dementia. So it is found that oral rehabilitation significantly reduces anxiety, social uh, isolation, depression, and stress. Okay, so uh, for screening, note problems during conversations. You ask the questions, do you feel you have hearing loss? So as simple as that, I guess response should prompt referral to ENT or to audiology. And you may also do a whisper test and a positive uh, whisper test should, uh, uh, patients should be referred to ENT or audiology. So for polypharmacy use, uh, Use, polypharmacy is defined as use of more medications that are clinically indicated. So when a uh, medication regimen contains at least one unnecessary drug. So it's not like as before that you have at least three or at least five uh, medications to label a patient as polypharmacy. So consider over-the-counter herbal and supplements used, and it is one of the many causes of hospitalization. So uh, we used to guide us the American Geriatric Society 2019 uh, BRS criteria. So this is an explicit list of uh, potentially inappropriate medications uh, that are typically best avoided by older adults in most circumstances or under specific situations such as in certain diseases or conditions. So it is used for uh, adults 65 years and older in all ambulatory, acute, and institutionalized settings of care except for the hospice and palliative care settings. So it appears to improve medication selection, reduce adverse drug events, and it can serve as a tool for evaluating quality of care, cost, and patterns of drug use of older adults. So apart from the BEERS criteria, we can also use the stop and the start screening tool. So these are explicit, uh, explicit criteria that facilitate medication review in multimorbid older people in most uh, clinical settings. So to do the CGA report outline, we put the following. So the reason for evaluation, we give a short medical history, current health status, including the uh, latest diagnostics done, a list of medications that the patient is currently taking, the functional status and your, the corresponding plans, nutritional assessment, cognitive assessment. We also include the false risk profile, including the gait and the balance emotional status, depression, anxiety, and spiritual status, uh, other geriatric syndromes, present and plans, uh, social and financial status of the patient, uh, environmental hazards, and advanced care plans, including goals and life-sustaining treatments. So advanced care plans, usually it's a separate, uh, no, separate report, uh, but advanced care plans, uh, is a good avenue to start um, talking about the advanced directives. So to end my talk, our population is aging and we will be encountering more lolos and lolas in our practice, regardless of our chosen fields and specializations. So with the knowledge on CGA or at least screening on geriatric syndromes that we know have huge impact in the care for older persons, we can always look beyond our specialty and collaborate with others. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bonaceda. So may I call on Dr. Arena to, yes, to facilitate our Q&A. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Benaventura and Dr. Benaceda for um, that very comprehensive and informative um, lecture. I know as a third year resident, well, I, that's going to be very helpful for me. Um, right now, we're going to open the floor for um, any questions or clarifications that... Um, <laughs> yes, Dr. Benaventura. <laughs> Sharon, uh, Dr. Banaseda, because recently di ba, we have this news about uh, Bruce Willis, the actor, being diagnosed with frontotemporal dementia. But we know that, let's say, about a year ago, a year or two ago, he was just, he was just mentioned in press releases that he had aphasia. 
So uh, since you mentioned uh, FTD in your lecture, um, uh, could you give us a better idea of like say how frequent it is and then what would be the more common signs that we would need to watch out for to be able to identify FTD and then how do we differentiate it from Alzheimer's? Uh, okay. So uh, I, I think uh, the different dementias are I don't know, um, for a uh, different topic though, but just for an overview, uh, probably. Uh, for the frontotemporal dementia, uh, you have uh, behavioral uh, variants such as uh, you have behavioral uh, disinhibitions. Uh, that's the most, uh, that's the most common um, differentiating uh, characteristic or very obvious uh, thing that we see for patients na when we see it in the clinic, uh, probably it's FTB. Uh, they have that behavioral disinhibitions, uh, stereotype compulsive uh, behaviors, and um, um, executive uh, dysfunction, uh, less of a memory problem, parang uh, not as uh, obvious as memory problems of your Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. but um, more of the executive function and really the disinhibition. Mm -hmm. uh, language, um, yes, uh, you FTD, uh, I'm not, uh, in, uh, as com in comparison with the AD, you know, and, uh, mm -hmm. it, it really has a problem with the language. Mm -hmm. uh, but with the Louis body, kasi uh, pwede rin meron. Yeah. Uh, but maybe the aphasia, although I'm not just really sure if it's uh, sa frontotemporal lang siya. But um, this, uh, clinical uh, features distinguishing FTD from the others. Language uh, is also a uh, 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 distinguishing characteristic of FTD. In, in, in behavior. Ano? Yes, po. Um, kasi as, as psychiatrist kasi, um, I, I guess more likely mga Alzheimer's talaga yung marerefer sa amin. So yung mga uh, individuals with yan, FTD and even LDD. Like in my practice the last five years ago, I've only seen two, three cases of uh, LDD. And, and these were primary referrals lang din. Uh, mainly nga for the behavioral problems that uh, they develop subsequently. So, so thank you very much for that, Dr. Benacerda. So we'll give others a chance to ask your questions yung mga younger members natin sa audience. Uh, thank you, Dr. Benaventura. Um, actually, Dr. Benacerda, I also have, on um, related to uh, Dr. Benaventura's question, um, I had, we had a referral before of a patient um, for possible personality disorder. She was a geriatrics, but also they were considering possibly dementia because of personality changes. Is that something you also notice uh, more on personality changes? Mm, yeah, actually, um, in geriatrics, since the signs and symptoms of, of uh, since there are signs and symptoms of a particular uh, condition or disease entity is not as typical as the younger ones. So um, just to give an example, no, uh, sometimes uh, they just... Um, they just uh, uh, routinely, let's say, they wash the dishes and then suddenly they don't wash the dishes anymore. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, most of the relatives will will um, will just tell us that maybe matanda na, pagod na. But it's actually could be an indication that something is going on. Um, so like with your question, Dr. Rano, yung personality uh changes niya is not an exception. So, uh, kahit um, um, wala talaga sa usual na criteria or uh, that is uh, the typical presentation of a particular uh, condition, be it psychiatric or be it uh, medical, any changes um, in the older persons can be uh, an indication that uh, something is uh, going on. Thank you so much, Po Doctora. Um, are there any other questions? Oh, Dr. Bocalbos. Hi. Um, good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Buenaceda, for the lecture. Um, 
you, you mentioned or ah okay first muna. um which has a better uh, reliability or ano ba tawag doon yung mas uh, ano ba, better yung yung pagka-catch ng symptoms the mocha or the um mini mental exam for geria so, patient Uh, for geria patient, it's the MOCA. And we uh, actually it also depends, doctora, with uh, the uh, educational attainment and the current mood of the patient. So uh, sometimes, no, if the patient is, um, let's say, uh, mata- uh, uh, the patient has a high uh, educational attainment, instead of just doing the MMSE, we proceed uh, straight with the uh, MOCA. Uh, since uh, CGA is long and we don't like the patient to get tired with the um with the screening tools otherwise we will just get uh, they will just perform poorly with these um tools just because they're tired so we go straight with the mocha but if the mocha um but when we find that the patient is really having a hard time with mocha we try to compare it with mmse so it actually depends on how the patient really performs but uh if i will to answer your question but it's the mocha that's more reliable thank you actually dr buena said that dun sa dun sa mocha siguro kung gagawin pag ginawa ko yun yung yung, yung magtatap pag sinabi yung letter a di ba meron ganun diba? may, may series of letters tapos every time the patient hears the letter a they tap their finger alam mo, nahihirapan ako doon. <laughs> ako <mismo. laughs> na feeling ko, pag binigay sa akin yung buho ka, hindi ko maipapas. Uh-oh. Actually, Doc, uh, the problem with the tapping, no, uh, we can, uh, it, it can be indicative of a problem of uh, ears naman, hearing impairment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, we also have a mocha na rin for hearing impaired. Then, mm, okay. But, <laughs> Ah, oh, that's good, ano? Ay, ah, talaga. So, I haven't heard of that. So, that's worthy to... Ano, yes, uh, Mocha. It's Mocha HI. Uh, pero it's not, ano, sa, it's not on, uh, it's not a Filipino uh, uh, version okay. naman. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Dr. Buenaseda, uh, are you able to do uh, CGA online? Or kailangan lang talaga siya face-to-face? Um, I do CGA online, pero sobrang mahirap lang po. And we need to um, discuss it first with the patient. So uh, with the history and the physical exam, no, sometimes we can get uh, things there that we can already put in the CGA. Mm-hmm. And then the rest, um, masyado nang pagod yung patient or it's taking too much uh, time na din. Uh, sin- it, uh, it's better na i-postpone po siya on the next clinic visit uh, than to than pilitin and um, maging pangit lang yung results po. Okay. Uh, thank you for mentioning that. So that, that, that means we can split uh, no? rather than uh, going through it through all of it at the same time kasi nga yung consideration na baka mahirapan din yung mapagod yung pasyente. Yes, es- opo. Especially ang older patients, they are Um, hesitant na nga with the online thing. So, the more na meron pang uh, answer and question portion, so that yeah. that will be a lot for most of them. Okay. Tapos, thank you also, Dr. Abanaseda, for mentioning yung beers criteria at saka yung stop-start. Okay. Um, kasi last, I think last December, tama Elham, dun sa Philippine College of Psychopharmacology na convention. That was one of the things that I mentioned. Kasi, I was asked to talk about drug interactions I mean the elderly. That's one of the things I mentioned was yung yung beers criteria at saka yung stop start. Is there any form of training for that? Um, kasi parang it's a bit very complex. Eh. Parang, uh, is there a way by which us as psychiatrists ano, uh, could, could learn more about using it? Um, I'm not really familiar with the training available in our country, though the Philippine College of Geriatric Medicine, they have this uh, training for trainers, but mm-hmm. I'm not sure if uh, beers criteria is included, included. but I oh, think okay. polypharmacy is included. But the beers criteria, if only you have time to uh, read the net, no? they can be um, ano naman, lifted online. Also, the start, stop, uh, uh screening tools uh they are also available online for free so hindi ko lang po siya ma 
flash <laughs> kasi mm. it's ano very uh, maba po talaga medyo uh, long maba po kasi one of the references that I came across particularly the beards and stuff like this was from the National Health Service from the UK sabi nga nila they use it a lot and then they even they actually train so even nurses can 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 do it for for their patients so, so yes yes pa as a screening too. Kasi nga, it's, it's one of the, yung drug interactions kasi ito, or adverse drug reactions, one of the biggest problems that we have in eld- among our elderly patients. And that's why I appreciate yes. it sa concluding statement mo nga na regardless of the kind of practice that we have, we have to expect na in the coming years talagang dadami yung mga nakakatanda nating maging pasyente. Yes po. And um, to add, Dr. No, with, uh, since we're talking about the polypharmacy, mm-hmm. um, kasi we tend to look at the symptoms of the patient eh, and uh, we add medications based on the symptoms, not knowing that these symptoms probably are already adverse uh, effects of uh, all the medications that the patient is taking. So take a look talaga or take into consideration everything that the patient takes, kahit mga collagen or any supplements right, so, okay. that they use that they buy online so yeah. everything po should be taken into consideration mm-hmm. so dr abel said how many training programs do we have in the country now for geriatric medicine um when i was in training po isa lang it's really the same it's so st mm-hmm. looks lang po pero uh I think last year or two years ago. So, uh, dumadami na po siya. Okay. Hindi ko lang alam yung exact number okay. po, doctor. Pero uh, mostly government hospitals. Okay. St. Luke's meron na rin po sa global. Mm-hmm. Um, and madami na rin po. Mm-hmm. Tapos, ilan na, ilan na geriatric geriatricians in the country? I... Um, Geriatricians, I think 150 to 200, but oh, okay. us po who train dito po sa mm-hmm. uh, Philippines, nasa 50 to 60. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh-huh. Kasi I keep, like when I do my psychogeriatric workshops, I often tell my my the participants to to look for a geriatrician in their area for, for easy referral. Mag-identify na sila so that uh, if they practice there in the let's say particularly outside of the metro ano tapos they have an elderly patient it would be ideal if they could refer to a geriatrician so mm. so in our case um, how would we be able okay. to find out kung may geriatrician in the area that we practice uh we don't have a list po kasi ah. talaga online so oh. we you ask the ano po your primary health uh, physician and then um uh, kami po like uh oh. in our uh group chats you know? <laughs> so we also ask if a geriatrician is present in this area or uh, more of ganun pa lang po no? mm. yeah yeah, ako maswerte kasi like at UERM, malapit lang ang St. Luke's Medical Center, QC. So, madali kaming makakapag-refer to a... Ger- likewise, likewise, Doc, with geriatric psychiatrists, we also need okay. <laughs> geriatric psychiatrists. Okay. Pukunti na lang nga kami, tapos iniwan pa tayo. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Tapos, that, so, so, nabanggit, uh, so for the for those who are from NCMH, you know, uh, if you had not caught it at, at, at the start, because I mentioned that at NCMH, may mga geriatricians na rin on staff. So they're very fortunate that uh, yung mga psychiatry residents natin, psychiatry consultants at NCMH are able to work with uh, geriatricians in their institution. Yes, Paul. Kasi sa UERM, di ba Elham, wala tayong geriatrician sa UERM, no? Wala pa siya. Okay. Si, inimbita ko noon, Sharon, si Doktora Kamaga to join me. Apo. Masyado na siyang busy sa OSMA at saka sa state. So, okay. I'm sorry, nakikwento na tayo. Any questions from the other members of the audience? Kung wala, I turn it over back to our MC, Nina. Thank you very much, Dr. Buenaceda. All right. Thank you po, Dr. If we do not have any more questions, we'll uh, proceed to our closing remarks. Uh, to be uh, for to be done by Dr. Bocatpos. Thank you, Dr. Almadine. Um, again, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sharon Antonio Buenaceda, for uh, the wonderful lecture. 
Uh, especially, uh, I am a child psychiatrist, so it's um, uh, somehow enlightening to review. <laughs> and of course, uh, thank you, Dr. Buenaventura, for entrusting this task to uh, the UERM Department of Psychiatry uh, so, uh, and to facilitate this um, uh, first session and uh, I think the succeeding ones. And um, uh, hopefully, since we will be having more sessions, um, I hope the residents will take advantage of this because uh, during my residency, it's really hard and uh, we only get to have uh, sessions during mid-year conventions. And um, although it was fun to have um, face-to-face -face workshops, but uh, this one would help. No? Parang ako nga, I, I, uh, recently, I... I I try not to see uh, geriatric patients. I refer them to Dr. Bong because I am not confident anymore. <laughs> so uh, I hope the residents and um, I think we have students also. Um, so since they're also seeing uh, these patients that um, we manage. So I hope you take advantage of this and we'll be seeing each other again. And uh, I thank you. And good afternoon, everyone. And now for the presentation of the cert, uh, certificate. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Bong or Rina? Uh, sorry, it's for uh, Dr. Bong Albus. Okay. So, the Philippine Psychiatric Association and the uh, URM Department of Psychiatry presents this Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Sharon Antonio Buena, Buenaceda for having rendered a valuable contribution as speaker on the topic Comprehensive Geriatric Assessment as part of the uh, Psychogeriatric Sessions, which was held today, March 6, 2023, via Zoom, uh, signed by Dr. Uh, John May Perez Rifarial, the PPA Board Secretary, and of course the uh, our president, PPA President, Dr. Robert D. Buenaventura, and uh, yours truly as the chair of the Department of Psychiatry, New ERM. So we'll be sending this to Dr. Uh, Buenaceda. Thank you again, Dr. Buenaceda. Thank you again, Dr. Buenaceda. So, Lina, we can wrap up now. Thank you. All right. And that concludes po our first lecture on psychogeriatrics. Thank you again, Dr. Benesteda, for that very helpful lecture. Um, and this concludes our uh, lecture. I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dan.